those videos, I spun the wheel, spun, spun, spun. I spun the wheel of neurodegeneration. I'm gonna spin my wheel of neurodegeneration. And it came up with Parkinson's disease. Ding! Parkinson's disease. And every time I've spun it since, it's come up with Parkinson's. Hence why I've made so many videos on Parkinson's, both for this channel and for Parkinson's movement. So, as you can see for this video, I've brought back the wheel of neurodegeneration, but I've taken Parkinson's off it so that we will definitely get a new topic. Let's give it a spin and see what happens. Ding! Alzheimer's disease. And coincidentally, September is World Alzheimer's Awareness Month. Maybe the wheel is still rigged. So in this video, I'm gonna do a general, let's get rid of, let's get rid of that. Ooh. <laughs> in this video, I'm gonna do a general overview of Alzheimer's. It's a massive topic with like a lot of different levels to it. So my plan is to start quite broad and then zoom in until we get into some real detail on current theories about what really causes it. So we're gonna get pretty sciencey up in here, but it's, I think with this kind of step-by-step -step approach, you'll be learning what I learned in my degree before you even realize it. And at the end, I'm gonna zoom back out and give an overview of current treatments and why they work. Let's do it. Starting off with the question, what is Alzheimer's? Alzheimer's is a neurodegenerative disorder, meaning that parts of the brain, neuro, degrade and die, degenerate. And as it's associated with memory loss, it may come as no surprise that the parts of the brain that are primarily affected are parts of the brain associated with memory formation, namely the entorhinal cortex and the hippocampus. And these are both found quite deep in the middle of your brain. However, as the disease progresses, it spreads outwards to your cerebral cortex. And this is when we see other symptoms to do with language and social behavior and reasoning symptoms like personality changes. So those are broadly speaking the effects of Alzheimer's on the brain, so now let's zoom in for the first time to get a little bit more detail. Which brain cells get degraded in Alzheimer's? Brain cells, or neurons, communicate with each other through receptors. Chemicals released from one neuron then attach to and interact with receptors on another neuron, and that's how messages get passed along. It's kind of like a, a Mexican wave of thought. Different neurons use different chemicals as their kind of messenger of choice, but all of these different messenger chemicals are generally known as neurotransmitters. Science word, neurotransmitters. And that makes sense, right? They transmit messages in the brain. Neuro, neurotransmitter. Now, whereas Parkinson's is generally associated with the loss of the neurotransmitter dopamine, Alzheimer's is associated with the loss of a different neurotransmitter, namely acetylcholine. Neurotransmitter word, acetylcholine. And this loss of acetylcholine is because in Alzheimer's, brain cells which normally pass on signals by releasing acetylcholine as their neurotransmitter degrade and die. So this reduces acetylcholine levels in the brain. Brief interruption here, I'm so hyper aware of pronunciational differences. Acetyl, acetyl, choline, choline, neuron, neuron, but you know what? As I've said before, take me as I am and we'll get on really well. How I say science words. So there we go, we've got reduced levels of acetylcholine in Alzheimer's. But as if having dysfunctions in one neurotransmitter pathway wasn't enough, there's actually more to Alzheimer's than just a reduction in acetylcholine. It's also thought that glutamatergic neurons might have a role to play. Oh, of course, glutamatergic, the word we all know. Just kidding, another science word, glutamatergic. Don't worry, you're not gonna get tested on all these names. Glutamatergic neurons are called that because they use glutamate to communicate. And glutamate is just another one of these neurotransmitters. These glutamatergic neurons are really important in the processes of learning and memory. However, rather than there being a lack of glutamate in Alzheimer's, as with acetylcholine, it's thought that the issue might be that there's too much glutamate. And this leads to something called excitotoxicity. Science words, here we go again. Excitotoxicity. Hmm. Excitotoxicity is basically where a neuron gets activated too much and it basically becomes under stress and strain and then that can lead to cell death. It's a bit like how my overenthusiasm and intensity eventually leads to the death of, of, of my relationships. <laughs> I feel like that might be a bit too real. <laughs> so to summarize, Alzheimer's is associated with the death of acetylcholine neurons, which then reduces the amount of acetylcholine, 
but overactivity of glutamate neurons which then makes them also die. But why are they dying? Is it just excitotoxicity? Or is something else putting these neurons under stress? It actually can't just be excitotoxicity because that wouldn't explain why the acetylcholine neurons are dying. So what is it that's making them die? Is it the same thing that's making the glutamate neurons die as well? I'm sorry, this is why I like science because there's so many questions. Okay, let's split up and look for clues. And by split up, I mean stay together and zoom in further on the brain. What does the brain of someone with Alzheimer's look like? And what can this tell us about the potential cause of neuron death? If we were to look into the brain of someone with Alzheimer's, there are a few characteristic things that we would spot other than shrinkage of certain brain areas. FYI, there are quite a few science words coming up and I'm not gonna keep dipping into the screen because I'll make you feel seasick. Um, don't worry about remembering them all. I'm just trying to paint a general picture of what the brain looks like. And also I feel like you can handle the technical terms, so. The first are these things called amyloid plaques. They're also known as senile plaques and they're basically just lumps of a substance called beta amyloid. Second are neurofibrillary tangles, or NFTs for short, and they're lumps of a different substance called tau. And thirdly, an increased level of inflammation. This is part of your body's immune system's response to getting rid of substances that it doesn't want there. These three things can act as sort of calling cards of Alzheimer's, with plaques and tangles especially appearing in the brain many, many years before someone actually starts showing symptoms like memory loss. In fact, by the time people do show symptoms like memory loss and get an official diagnosis of Alzheimer's, many parts of their brain are already irreversibly damaged. And so this has led to theories that try and connect amyloid plaques and NFTs and inflammation to the actual initial cause of brain cell death and damage in Alzheimer's. For example, it's thought that amyloid plaques, as they aggregate and grow, they actually physically might push aside the connections neurons have and so disrupt their action in that way. It's suspected as well that these plaques increase the stress put onto neurons and so could contribute to cell death in that way. The tangled NFTs are thought to play a similar physical getting in the way role, blocking neuron transport systems and again affecting communication across our brain cells. It's literally like there are these lumps that are just physically getting in the way of your brain functioning normally. Then inflammation worsens as your immune system kicks in and tries to get rid of these placky, tangly lumps. But as more and more amyloid aggregates, it can't keep up and the inflammation in your brain just gets worse and worse. So the evidence kind of points to it ending up as this vicious, messy cycle. As you can probably tell, there's a lot of pieces in this puzzle of what causes Alzheimer's. And as they all sort of layer over each other and cross interact, it becomes very difficult to track down a root cause. So let's zoom in again. This time we're gonna focus just on amyloid because when you've got a whole list of things to pick apart from one another, you may as well start with one. And also, gene studies have linked a generally increased level of amyloid in the brain to Alzheimer's. So amyloid seems like a pretty good place to start. The amyloid hypothesis of Alzheimer's. So just as a reminder, these amyloid plaques are made of a substance called beta amyloid. Now beta amyloid production is a normal part of your brain's function. It is meant to be there. So what makes it turn rogue and go all dangerous and clumpy? Well, it turns out that size matters because beta amyloid can come in different lengths. You see, beta amyloid is made from a different substance called amyloid precursor protein or APP for short and snappy. So you can think of APP as this bit of chocolate. When it's chopped into a smaller chunk, it's not APP anymore, it's beta amyloid. But it can be chopped in a few different places and this determines its size. So the chopping combination becomes really important. If APP gets chopped here and here, you get a beta amyloid fragment that is 40 peptides long. So this is known as beta amyloid 40. Think of the peptides as the squares that make up the chocolate, or if you had a chain, each of the links in the chain would be a peptide. So yeah, you can get a beta amyloid fragment that's 40 peptides long. However, if our original APP were to get chopped here and here, then our peptide fragment would be longer. This is actually 42 peptides long. 
Now a peptide is so, so small, and yet this tiny two peptide difference could have huge repercussions. Studies have suggested that this slightly longer beta amyloid 42 is far more likely to form nasty plaques. And if these plaques do then trigger a cascade of events which eventually leads to Alzheimer's disease, then that two peptide difference is a real game changer. It's not a game changer, it's a life changer. As I hope I'm revealing, Alzheimer's is a really complicated disorder. But as time goes on, we're adding more information to the map of how everything links together. You know, like when detectives have a wall with all like pictures on and then they have they have evidence and they have the, all the string that links it all together and that, that's kind of essentially what science research in a field like this is. However, of course, for the approximately 50 million people living with Alzheimer's globally, that's all interesting and it's good that research is being done, but it's not gonna help their symptoms right now. So I'm gonna end on a quick run through of the current treatments for Alzheimer's and how they work. So there are two main current drug treatments for Alzheimer's. There's one that focuses on reduced levels of acetylcholine, and then there's the one that focuses on the overactivity of glutamate. Our acetylcholine approach involves drugs known as acetylcholine esterase inhibitors. Now like with lots of things in science, it's a really long name, but as soon as you start breaking it down, it starts to make more sense. That's why science phrases are like the opposite of me. They make more sense when they break down. I think something's broken. That's twice now I've said a really dark thing in this recording. Honestly, I'm absolutely fine. It's just my self-deprecation vibes. So, acetylcholine esterase inhibitors, what are they? Well, acetylcholine is our neurotransmitter. That's what we need more of. Acetylcholine esterase is an enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine. So really, it's adding to our problem by depleting the already low levels of acetylcholine that we've got in the brain. An acetylcholine esterase inhibitor, therefore, inhibits the enzyme, it stops its action. In other words, it stops it from breaking down acetylcholine, and so that leads to an increased level of acetylcholine in our brains. And so giving people acetylcholine esterase inhibitors is one way that the symptoms of Alzheimer's can be reduced. Another slightly less common, but still current treatment, approaches from the glutamate angle. These drugs are known as NMDA receptor antagonists. So let's break that down again. NMDA receptors are a specific type of glutamate receptor. In other words, they're activated by glutamate, or in the case of our dangerous excitotoxicity, they're overactivated by glutamate. An antagonist is something which opposes something else. So it's like when someone's being antagonistic and they're basically just being a pain in the ass. So a receptor antagonist blocks the action of a specific type of receptor. So while excessive glutamate is making neurons excited to the point of damaging themselves, an NMDA receptor antagonist stops that excitement by blocking the action of the receptor at the very beginning. They're like, chill out. So those are two of the main current drug treatments. And although they are the main ones, there's also studies looking into anti-inflammatory drugs to bring the inflammation levels down and anti-amyloid drugs to try and stop amyloid from over-aggregating. It's also worth pointing out that Alzheimer's drugs seem to have different levels of effectiveness across different people. And this is probably because of a few reasons, probably partly because of the complicated nature of the disease and also because we're all different and so we all will have a different fingerprint of symptoms in our individual brains. However, an overarching issue with all the treatments, whether they work on you or not, is that they don't reverse cell death and damage. And as I said earlier, by the time someone's diagnosed with Alzheimer's, a lot of irreversible damage has already been done to their brain, and we don't have a way to undo that. So this means that if we want to find a way to reduce the levels of brain damage in Alzheimer's, we need to find a way to diagnose it earlier. This is where biomarkers come in. A biomarker is essentially a little biological signpost that can tell us how severe someone's disease is or if they've got any symptoms at all. However, I'm not gonna go into them here. I've actually just started making videos for neuroscience news and research, and I post them up on the platform LabTube. I made a video for them this month all about Alzheimer's biomarkers, so if you wanna check it out, I'll pop the link in the description. Or on a card, can I do that? We'll see where it is. I do briefly cover the basics like I do at the beginning of this video, but you can skip through it, or you can watch it again, or you can not watch it at all, whatever you fancy. <laughs> Also in that video, I talk about my favourite thing, which is current research, so do give it a watch if you like. But yeah, I guess that's, that's it for now. As I mentioned at the beginning, in videos like this, I guess I try and give a broad overview of the topic, but then not shy away from the more kind of recent theories that are coming up in the field. I remember when I was first like getting into science, and I 
you still want people to not shy away from that kind of more theoretical detail. Because to me, that's really exciting. It's like the cutting edge. And it shows that scientists don't know everything. And there's so many questions out there to answer. Because when I was younger, I thought scientists knew everything. And that's really wrong. But I guess I just hope I got the balance of kind of broad and complicated okay in this video. Or I guess in this video, it was more the balance of broad, complicated, and really dark comments about my self-esteem. The holy trio. <laughs> anyway, thanks so much for watching. Have a lovely day. And remember to keep asking questions. And here's a summary where you realise that this is essentially what the video tells you if you cut out all of my bizarre banter. Pause it and read it if that's what you want to do. It's your thing, yeah. Do what you want to do, yeah. Whatever you feel. No, glutamate isn't what I shout down the street to get my friend Gluta's attention. Oi, Gluta, mate. <laughs> and if you give a damn, you can unsubscribe. <laughs> Is mean. You don't have to unsubscribe. Dairy milk, big taste Oreo. Hashtag not spawn, hashtag not add content. I just smell it when I open it. Oh my god. I don't feel like that was a mammoth. It feels like Christmas.